My name is Dr. Mizani. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, where you are located in Chicago, I'm joined by Ms. Narissa Pollack. I'm sure you've all gotten to know her. She is uh, one of the most experienced uh, residency enrollment strategists that uh, we have here at Ameri Clerkships Medical Society. And for that, I'm really proud to be able to uh, uh, have her come over there to meet with you in person. And uh, for all of you who joined us uh, online, uh, welcome uh, as well. And you can certainly um, uh, communicate with us through your questions uh, through uh, YouTube Live. So with no further ado, uh, let's go ahead and start our presentation uh, today, which is going to focus on uh, the 2017 and 2018 residency match timelines, tips, and then we're going to get into answering your questions uh, that uh, you've uh, filled out in your, uh, in your registration uh, questionnaire and also anything from the crowd there in Kaplan, uh, Chicago. Uh, before we start, uh, the disclaimer for today is that you're going to hear a lot of names, uh, a lot of test names, uh, and other trademarks such as ERAS, ECFMG, SOAP, NRMP, and the match. And these are all the property of respective trademark holders. And none of these trademark holders are affiliated with American Clerkship's Medical Society for uh, or our website. Um, so the the theme here today is to compile a complete residency application by August 15th. Uh, you're all preparing to get into residency. And uh, as you're preparing for the USMLEs, as I was, uh, we were always just focused on getting a really high score on the USMLEs and kind of all the other things that, uh, that went along with the USMLEs and the main reason why we were studying for the USMLEs kind of fell uh, by the wayside. And so, you know, right now we're in March. Uh, so sometime in June and July, we typically start thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we need to uh, apply to residency as well because residency is going to start by next July. And we kind of, uh, you know, miss uh, the, the fact that uh, we have to prepare almost a year and a half in advance. Um, and we have to multitask. Uh, and it's really possible to do uh, everything. But we just have to be accepted. We have to uh, learn how to multitask. And, and we got to know what we have to do. So we've uh, broken down our timeline um, into March uh, to August and then also September to February of next year, right? So let's go ahead and begin with March. This is the, the end point, right? This is what everybody waits for. It's called the match week. Um, and if you match, you certainly prepare for uh, starting residency by mid-June. And if you're unmatched, then you prepare for NRMP Supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program, which used to be called the old SOAP. And essentially, people that have less than six interviews really have to consider uh, why uh, they have to consider participating in SOAP and the chances of matching is a little bit less. But if you have more than six interviews, certainly the chances of matching is going to be uh, a lot more. So that's the end point. That's what you're going after. And for 2016, match week starts March 14th. So for those of us that are not participating in this year's residency start, um, then we have to start thinking about uh, preparing for the 2017 residency match. And if you, by the end of this, you see that it is absolutely impossible for you to squeeze in all of this work um, before uh, August 15th, then you have to think about possibly 2018 match. And it's not always a good thing to keep waiting, right? Because a lot of things change. There are more U.S. medical graduates that are applying to residencies, but there are some good things happening for international medical graduates as well, which is the single accreditation system, which will ultimately add about 5,500 residency slots that used to only belong to osteopathic doctors and now MDs can apply to. So there are some good things. There's some challenging things that are happening, but at the end of the day, you don't want to just keep procrastinating and waiting until uh, next year comes around. So let's see if we can do this. Let's see if we can do this for the 2017 match, which means that our application has to be ready by this August 15th so that we can apply on September 15th of this year. So you want to uh, complete your step one uh, by second half of March. And this right here, you may say, well, well I, can't, I can't do that. I just started my step one preparation. And that may be the case. So we may need to do a little more squeezing. Um, and uh, for those that have taken step one, you await the results. Uh, and, uh, and by this point, you actually have a good idea 
uh, about who's going to write your letters of recommendation. Uh, you want to start confirming five U.S. clinical sites for your clinical experiences. And that's one of the reasons why Mary Clerkships is there too. We have a great relationship with Kaplan. Uh, and uh, many of you who are Kaplan Complete Preps, uh, you are uh, entitled to up to eight weeks of U.S. clinical experiences for which we're very proud to be able to service you and Mr. Nurse Pollock is there. But it's not just about clinicals, it's about just really getting you ready, working together with your medical advisors so that you can have a complete residency application. So once you get up to five clinical sites in mind, right, um, then you want to start uh, and preferably finish the first of your five U.S. clinical blocks at the same time in the month of March. And then you say, well, look, Dr. Mazzani, I haven't even taken my step one. How can I finish my uh, clinical experiences? And again, this may add to the, the point of what well, you may actually need to wait to the 2018 match, which you may not like to wait. And there are some other options, such as just participating in the supplemental offer and acceptance program. I just don't want you to give up at this point. I want you to know that this is what it takes to get a complete residency application together. Um, once you finish your first clinical block, of course, Mary Clerkships has a great relationship, but it's a 10 physicians and you can uh, ask your attending physician for an evaluation and if it's positive then you ask for a letter of recommendation and then you want to begin to prepare for your second U.S. clinical experience block. You want to start to think about what your medical residency brand is. You want to narrow your choices down to three specialties and you want to begin to schedule your step two CS to be taken by June and and start looking at possibly at program requirements and what is the program's wish list and what is an absolute uh, requirement and what is uh, what will be an extreme match, right? So, for example, it's one of those wish lists that you may have um, that you know. Look, I want to I want to get into dermatology, even though you know that the number of U.S. medical graduates are significantly higher than international medical graduates, and it's a very competitive specialty. You may want to do that, but you want to have a backup plan too, because at the end of the day, we don't want to keep waiting year after year after year because that will damage your residency application. Um, so then, after uh, in the month of April, you want to begin your CK preparation. Right? You want to think about the first paragraph of your personal statement. You want to start volunteering with nonprofits, uh, not just free clinics, right? Because a lot of times uh, when we go to free clinics, these free clinics let us do a lot, but then we completely ignore the liability portion of things, right? Uh, because uh, you, know, you have to have professional liability insurance as a medical graduate. All the medical students that are here in the room with us, uh, all of you, ha your medical schools provide professional liability insurance, which is that's why which you, you can you can really interact with patients and there are laws that protect you. Uh, but as medical graduates, we have to be a lot more careful. So just joining free clinics, it could actually uh, end up being a lot more dangerous than uh, than, than than helpful. Um, by the the first part of April, you want to start your second of five U.S. clinical experiences, uh, and uh, and you want to confirm your desired selective specialty, and you when you want to continue to refine your USMLE, uh, your 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 brand, and uh, you want to submit your letters of recommendation for some sort of professional analysis. So again, remember it's April residency application must be submitted in September. So you really have April, May, June, July, August. So you only have five months to go. So that's. Why time is really squeezed. Now, for those of you that have decided that you're going to apply in 2018, well, perfect, because this is going to work out perfectly for you because then by this point, you would have a lot of breathing room and you can juggle your step one, step two, maybe spread out some of the clinical experiences around and your schedule doesn't have to be as compact. Then at this point, you want to narrow your choices down to two specialties. I'm not a fan of, uh, of applying to multiple specialties uh, and, uh, and, and, because you have to show your commitment to one specialty and you have a lot better chance of securing residency interviews that way uh and um and so uh so that's uh that's uh, where it's going to lead us to the second half of april at this point uh things are going to feel a little bit quiet but uh, there's really four months left to finalizing your eras application uh you want to implement your step two ck study calendar and strategy uh, your second clinical block would be done by this point. I recommend that you join also Toastmasters and a Toastmasters will help you with your public speaking, which will ultimately help you with your residency interviews as well. You want to approach your first letter writer for updates, corrections, if your letter of recommendation analysis um, uh, calls for, for such. And by the way, as an Ameri Clerkships member, letter of recommendation analysis is included in all of our certified memberships and, and higher. Um, and that way you will know whether you have a good letter of recommendation or not. And then uh, if you have publications, you want to ensure that your publications are in PubMed and you have a reference ID for them. So here comes May. 
Well, you want to start working on your third letter of recommendation. You want to work with your medical school to get a copy of your medical student performance evaluation. Now, if you're a U.S. medical graduate, most likely your medical school will not share NMSPE with you. But if you're an international medical student or graduate, most likely your school will share an MSPE with you. And remember that MSPE, a lot of deans are still treating it as an old dean's letter. So they're writing a lot of glorious things about you and how great of a person you are and it's really a character reference and it's not it's not a hundred percent objective and MSPE should not be absolutely recommending you to residency and MSPE should be talking about your performance versus all the other students should have graphical analysis and should be matter of fact and let the reader make that decision so that's one of the biggest issues that we face when we see a medical student performance evaluation you've at this point you should narrow your choices down to one or two specialties you want to complete your personal statement draft for each one of those two specialties and you want to start saving up to apply to 200 plus programs per specialty and then you want to schedule your ck exam in june or july you just got to keep in mind that your cs exam is supposed to be in june and by mid to end of may uh, at this point you would have completed uh you, you will complete hopefully your five-day usmle cs prep um, you will finish your third of five U.S. clinical experience blocks. You will ask your attending uh, for an evaluation. If it's positive, then you want to ask for a draft letter of recommendation the same way as you did for the previous two clinical blocks. You want to continue your continued medical education, right? And you can do a lot of that on Medscape. There's a lot of free programs online that will help you do that. Um, and, uh, and you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's a lot of great videos that we post uh, at least once a month. Uh, and so subscribe to it. I'll show you at the end uh, uh, what that entails. Um, and uh, there will be workshops and, uh, and a lot of really good information behind closed door information. Uh, and then at this point, you want to kind of don't forget about your curriculum vitae or your resume. Uh, you want to keep that updated because that's going to come up. Uh, your, your attending physicians may ask for it. People that really like you uh, are going to ask for it during your clinical experiences. And, and, uh, and that's going to really prove to be um, very helpful. Now, June, this is where it gets really busy. You want to have your fourth clinical block started. You want to reflect upon your U.S. clinical experiences and evaluations to make sure that you've addressed any weaknesses. You want to make sure everything is consistent across your entire residency application package. Uh, and uh, you want to volunteer on weekends, ensure that you're satisfied with your selection of residency uh, specialty that you've, uh, that you've picked. And by late June, you want to finish your fourth or fifth clinical block. You want to ask your attending physicians for evaluations. And if it's positive, ask for a letter of recommendation. And you want to take your step to CS exam, right? And so this is the recipe for somebody, anybody in the room that wants to be qualified for the 2017 match. That's what you have to do. And so by early July, uh, you will be in your fifth clinical block. Uh, it, there may be some possible U.S. clinical experience delays. Uh, you will get your ERAS token from ECFMG. And if you're a medical student uh, or if you've graduated uh, no less than two years from, uh, from today, so if you graduated in uh, this is this March of 2016, so by no later than March of 2014, you will qualify to be able to attend the American Academy a family physicians national conference for example um and where there's there's over 300 family medicine residency programs all of the one the roof and they will just it's like a massive interview uh and they just want to they sell themselves to you and there's a lot of these type of events all over uh and that's how you get to really prepare yourself for which programs you want to apply to so if they've already seen you in the national conference you'll be able to uh uh, you know, you'll be having a second impression on them when they see your application and they would have recognized you. And you want to take your step two CK exam. Um, so here comes late July, right? You want to focus on your ERAS residency application. The, the whole uh, dynamic kind of shifts now to, you know, putting everything that you've done together. You put everything in your ERAS application. Uh, your fifth clinical block will be done. You want to focus on your residency application. Submit it for professional review and revision. You want to make sure everything is consistent. Uh, work out any delays with your ECFMG certification. You want to communicate clearly uh, with your medical school and ask for them to cooperate with you. You want to get your medical student performance evaluation and you want to apply for ECFMG certification after you're done with all of your examination. Early August, um, that's where the uh, uh, AAFB National Conference is. You want to reassess your overall U.S. clinical experience status. 
Uh, are your letters of recommendation strong? Uh, do you want to plan to one to two clinical blocks during the match season, right? From September to uh, uh, February, March. And you want to cancel any trips in September to January. And we want to pre present, you want to be present in the United States for any last minute interviews. And that happens uh, a lot. So if you've gone abroad, if you're in the Middle East, if you're in South America, it may be a little bit difficult or really expensive for you to keep going back and forth. India, uh, very, very difficult to get back to the United States in, in on drop of a, of a you know, very short notice. So kind of think about these. Late August, you want to put the finishing touches on your residency application, and then you should simply be fine-tuning things at this point. And you want to assess whether you should apply on September 15th or possibly delay a little bit because this recipe is very very condensed and it may not work for everybody and so at that point you may think okay well i've taken all my us mles um and uh and you know i need to just delay just a little bit maybe a week or two is that really going to hurt my chances and that doesn't always hurt your chances right um it, it could actually help you and we'll certainly talk with you about it um one of the benefits of joining Ameri Clerkships is that we have office hours where uh, I take full responsibility of, as, as being your residency advisor during office hours and you come in, we talk about strategies, we see what's the best thing uh, for you to do so that you don't ever feel like you're alone. And then you compare uh, our recommendations with, uh, uh, with your med advisors and everybody else and you just keep talking about things uh, and figure out how other people have done it and then you come up with your best way that fits your uh, lifestyle and what your uh, uh, mission is in this entire process. Um, and uh, so at this point in August, you say, okay, well, I've completed four or five clinical blocks. What do I do now? I'm done, right? Well, you want to plan for, to, for doing residency relevant work because they're going to ask you during interviews, what are you doing right now? So you want to have a response of saying, well, I'm doing residency relevant type of work because your competition are really U.S. medical students and international medical students that are in their fourth year, in their last year of medical school, and they are doing their clinical clerkship. So whenever they get asked, they're going to say, oh, I'm finishing my elective. I'm doing cardiology, pulmonology, et cetera. Uh, but graduates have a little bit tougher time, so just prepare for it, and, uh, and uh, you know, you'll be fine. So now we want to talk about September to February, right? September to February, here's early September. You want to list all of your specialties of interest. Uh, omit those that you cannot see yourself doing. You want to Google search, choosing a medical specialty. What specialty are you? Uh, quizzes. There's a lot of good resources uh, online. And um, again, you've narrowed things down. U.S. medical graduates, you want to delete any reasons related to job shortage or oversupply of physicians in the specialty, right, in your application. Uh, delete any reasons related to lifestyle uh, or money. This is for everybody. Uh, unless those concerns are from significant others, right? Delete any heritage reasons. Um, uh, write down your own pros and cons, independent of any advice from anybody else. Uh, did you have a really tough time passing the US MLEs? And who's really your competition? And, uh, and, and essentially, once you go through all of these, uh, then you'll be able to find out what specialty is really uh, right for you. So hopefully everything will be confirmed by that time. So here is the holy grail of this entire 365 days uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a match cycle, September 15th. This is the day that we've been preparing for because by this day, hopefully you'll have um, a complete residency application based on, you know, you have four solid letters of recommendation. You may have five, one of them may be weak. That's why we have you doing five clinical experiences, five clinical blocks with five different clinical sites. Uh, and then you would have saved up for applying to 200 programs per, uh, per specialty, not, you know, 100 internal medicine, 25 pediatrics, 75 psychiatry. That's not 200 programs. That's 200 programs per specialty. And uh, so you're looking at right around $4,000 for 200 programs. So just make sure that you save up for it. Um, and that there are some really good questions with regards to, uh, you know, which programs do I, um, uh, do I work with, uh, uh, you know, which ones do I apply to? And we'll answer all of that. By October 1st, medical student performance evaluations are released. If your medical school signs up for the electronic communication with ECFMG, um, then, then, then the school is not going to be able to give you a copy of it and for you to upload it. ECFMG will electronically communicate everything with your medical school, and there's no way around that. Um, and you want to treat every interview as your only one, right? Interviews begin in October, so make sure you ask for help. There's some great resources uh, here at American Clerkships. There's some great resources uh, there at Kaplan, and I'm sure you know some attending physicians as well. But just remember, 
physicians are of great help, those that are practicing right now, but they also, their first priority is to make sure that they see patients, that they pay their bills. So whenever they give us advice, it may be a little, feel like a little bit rushed. They may not ask every question that is necessary. And some of their advices may be um, a little bit too quick. And so just keep that in the back of your mind uh, and, and, and uh, don't get upset if you feel like you didn't get the, the absolute best advice possible. By late October, you want to start your fifth clinical block, right? So at that point, if, if during an interview they ask you, um, uh, what are you doing right now? You say, well, I'm starting my you know, pediatrics, for example, or doing an elective in pediatric. I'm doing a second clinical block or a third clinical block in pediatrics. And that sounds really nice. Um, and you want to, when you get an interview, it means that judgment has been made, that your credentials are sufficient for you to succeed in that program. Um, and so at that point now, you have to perform during this interview. And you want to be nice to everybody. You want to be prepared for the absolute extremes. Um, and uh, you want to be prepared for people that really know your application in and out. Anything you say on the application is fair game for them to ask you and, uh, and, and ask you in very detail and very uncomfortable uh, detail as well. So uh, be ready for it. And that's why you want to make sure that your application is professionally put together. November, interviewing uh, continues. And uh, you must have at least uh, five same specialty interviews by now in November. And if you don't, still okay, uh, because uh, interviews could still be coming. Uh, but towards the end of November, that's the race to the finish line, right? November 30th, that's when NRMP now opens up. So all of this was in ERAS. You, lose, you use electronic resident application services to apply to programs. And then you use national resident matching program. You use that to rank the programs that you interviewed at. So two separate uh, entities, you have to register for both of them. NRMP match uh, early registration deadline begins and November 30th, it will be sometime around the end of November. We don't have the 2017, 2018 match uh, timelines yet. This presentation is prepared obviously right before match week of 2016 match. So when time comes, just remember end of November, that's when early registration of NRMP begins which also means that that's when the most number of interviews have been given out. And in December, there's still some interviews remain. Um, if you have not had any interviews at all, uh, or if you have less than six interviews, so if you have five interviews, four or three, uh, then you have to consult uh, somebody who's a specialist and consider supplemental offer and acceptance program just in case, right? It's much better to strategize in December than it is to strategize the week before match week. Right. So, um, you know, I, I work with many individuals that are just preparing a week to two weeks ago. And remember that once you some, uh, certify your residency application, you can't change it. So you want to make sure that everything is uh, is looked over and, and from the p perspective that you are going to soap just in case. So your application would have to be prepared properly. Um, January, you begin to compile your own res uh, rank order list, right? Which programs you interviewed at, uh, which one did you like? And uh, by February, uh, you think about your, the locations of the places you interviewed at, what's the patient population like, what the faculty like, uh, was it a community versus a hospital uh, uh, facility, how were the resident salaries, uh, benefits, uh, you know, what's the prestige like, uh, was there an opportunity for research? These are all the questions that you ask yourself. Uh, before you submit your rank order list. Then, you know, February 26, somewhere towards the end of February, uh, match registration and rank order list certification deadline uh, occurs and you must submit your rank order list. And at that point, uh, you uh, you are in uh, for, uh, uh, for seeing if, you, if the match algorithm will help you uh, match into a position. And if not, then you would have to go through a supplemental offer and acceptance program in March, which is where this presentation started. So there's a lot more to talk about, clearly, and that's one of the reasons why Ms. Nurse Pollock is there and uh, conducting one-on-one -on -one residency uh, strategy interviews with all of you. Uh, when you were not there in front of you, please go ahead and subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, and it is uh, uh, youtube.com forward slash Mizani MD. And uh, when, um, oh, sorry. And uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, you know, certainly with uh, with uh, Miss Nurse Pollock being there, uh, I want to make sure that uh, you do register for one on one residency strategy uh, interviews. And uh, let me make sure that I uh, finish this presentation up for you as well. And so. 
uh, here are the different ways that, uh, that you'll be able to uh, sign up for our one-on-one -on -one residency strategy. You can do it in person, Skype, Google Hangouts, or you just shoot an email to enroll at americlerkships.org or just hunt down Miss Nurse Pollock where she's at and uh, she'll make sure that she fits you in. And if she can't, then she'll hold the Skype or Google Hangout session with you uh, in the evenings or when she comes back to California. Um, and uh, now at this point, I'd love to be able to answer any of your questions. And so Ms. Pollock, uh, let me know if you want me to just go through the list of questions that were asked, or if there's anybody there that wants to, uh, that has raised his hand and I can go ahead and answer the question in the next 15 minutes that we have remaining. Okay, so I have a question. Why do you want them to do the step two here by June? Because you want to have a complete residency application by September, well, by end of August, uh, so that by September 15, when you apply, there'll be no questions about whether you're going to pass an examination or not. Uh, passing CS examination is, uh, is a very highly uh, rank criteria, but pipe program directors, when they want to consider somebody for a residency interview, it's not as high as step one and step two, but certainly it's in the top 10 uh, criteria for offering you a residency interview. And so you want to make sure that that box is checked and you've already passed it by that time. All right, while we wait for our, yes. Through the questions that were asked. Yes, absolutely. So I'd like to go, for, right, I'll just go down the list. And uh, this first question was asked by Dr. Patel. Uh, how do you get into highly competitive surgery residency programs? One of the, you know, unfortunately for trademark reasons, we can't display NRMP's um, match data. But if you go to NRMP's webpage, it's nrmp.org, and click on main match data, Scroll all the way down to the bottom. There's a program director, 2014 program director survey, and uh, look for general surgery and look for the criteria that those program directors utilize to give applicants interviews. It's an enlightening experience. And you'll notice that step one is, of course, is there. Step two is the performance is there. It may not be as popular, but it may be, but it's pretty important uh, to them. So there are two rankings that you see there. And it's different for every specialty. You'll notice that letters of recommendation from specialty is very important. Commitment to surgery is going to be extremely important. So how do you show commitment to specialty such as surgery? Um, you can say that I'm very committed. You could say that I was a surgeon in, in another country for three, four years. That may help you. It may hurt you uh, because in residency, we kind of want to be able to teach you ourselves regardless of specialty. So it's a very fine line between how much experience you show as somebody who was a supervisor versus somebody who is a student and is very teachable. Um, so take a look at that and you'll notice uh, what the criteria are. Of course, getting high USMLE scores is important, but it's, it's as important as all the other items uh, that, uh, that we just talked about in preparing for residency application. There is a research that was published uh, in, in PubMed, and, uh, and there is a correlation between individuals applying late uh, during the match cycle, let's say by mid-October, uh, more than 34 days uh, after September 15th, and the quality of their application. There's an inverse correlation. So um, the later that they, uh, that they wait, the poorer quality of their application. So another thing that you should be really focusing on is having your complete application ready to submit by September 15th and applying to a lot of surgical programs. So that's, the, um, that's one of our questions. Uh, Ernie, yes. Um, we have a couple questions. Yes, please. So my the first question was from a student asking if he should take step three prior to applying. Great. And what your opinion about that is. Yeah, great question. Um, thank you for asking that. I haven't gotten to that, but I really appreciate you asking that. Um, step three is a test of internship. I certainly recommend that you prepare for it. Uh, I certainly recommend that you take practice exams. But I absolutely do not recommend that you sit for the examination if you don't have proper U.S. clinical experience. And I'm not just talking about research. I'm not talking about um, shadowing uh, or, um, you know, if you have proper extended experience in the United States, then I think step three taking it is important. Just remember, if there's a failure in step three, what you're essentially, A, it's not a required examination. Um, B, and essentially what you're telling programs is I failed internship if I even start with you. So that doesn't really leave a good impression. Um, so uh, 
you know, the other thing is you'll speak with some program directors and you'll let them know that you're an international medical graduate and they'll probably say immediately, you got to pass step three. And I found that to be a very quick answer. That's one of the quick responses and suggestions that I've, I've heard from uh, a lot of program directors. And I sometimes, I call that a bad friendly advice because, you know, they don't have the time to really sit down and go through your entire application and give you constructive criticism. Imagine, look how many people are sitting in the auditorium right now. Could you imagine if a program director had to sit down and answer everybody's question? And that's just impossible and having to carry out the daily obligation. So very quick response, usually that is kind of fail safe for them is yes, passing step three. If you pass step three, is it great? Absolutely. It's fantastic. You know, you have another, that's another jewel on your crown, but the chances of failing is, is uh, something to be really considered as well. Dr. Mazzani, I have another question. Yes, please. So I have a student that asks, if they take a year or time off when they step one, do you recommend that? Or yeah. how much time should they take in comparison to other students? Right. I mean, take a look at the timeline that we just uh, shared with you. And, you know, the timeline, if you give yourself an entire year to just focus on a step one, of course, high scores are, are great. They're, they're fantastic. But look at all the opportunities that you'll be missing. And plus, it looks really, really bad to have this one year gap in your residency application that you cannot explain. And you don't really want to tell a program that, you know, if they ask you, well, what have you been doing between 2016, March of 2016 and and April of 2017, you can't say, well, I was at Kaplan studying for step one that, you know, we love Kaplan, but that doesn't really sit well for program directors because your competition only had two months, three months to study for each one of those exams and pass it. So our recommendation um, is, uh, is, is always to pass all of the USMLEs, which is one, two CK and CS within a 12 month period, and then speckle it with some clinical experiences in the middle. So your application begins to feel like a student right? Because students study for USMLEs and take clinicals, and you just hope that they don't really try to dissect your entire application and figure out minute by minute what you did. Um, that's usually a good way to go about it. And remember, when licensure comes, uh, they will ask you from the time that you started medical school, uh, medical boards will ask you to, most of them will, uh, will ask you to clearly uh, state what you've been doing in any gaps more than 30 days. Right. So just begin to think five, six years down the line. How do I answer that question? Because again, you know, that's another challenge. And, and I actually faced that. I completed everything uh, for Georgia Medical Board. And then they all of a sudden popped up a requirement for me that they said, well, we need you to prove that you actually went to medical school in Belize. And I said, how do you want me to do that? I have all my, you know, my transcripts are here. I have my grades. I was there. I have pictures, photos. No, we need to make sure that every term you were down in this country. And so they made me show my passport, my entry and exit stamps, right? That I went there and uh, one of my friends had lost his passport. So he had to get letters notarized by, by his classmates and by the Dean of school. It was just, you know, it was crazy. So you have to explain any time gaps and, and they're very, very sensitive to time gaps and they want to make sure that it's explainable. Thank you, Bonnie, Bonnie. Um, I have another question. Yes. And it was... Um, okay, so a young lady was asking elective versus U.S. clinical experience. So she's a graduate, so she can't do student courtship, but she can do U.S. clinical. Can you elaborate on what she can and can't do? And she's asking, can I still touch patients? Okay, great question. Great question. Um, so the different types of clinical experiences available uh, in the United States legally. Uh, they range anywhere from shadowing uh, and research to medical student uh, for credit clinical clerkships. And, uh, and medical graduates kind of fall somewhere in the middle. And uh, the, the type of clinicals that medical graduates should not do uh, are those that are uninsured um, and those that are just purely shadowing, that doesn't really help you. If it's uninsured, you're just carrying this liability. And uh, when you start residency, the, the hospital is going to ask how you accounted for your time. And if you mention clinicals, there's a high chance that the medical staff office is going to ask for the tail coverage of insurance during that time that you had patient coverage. And, uh, and Ameri Clerkships does that. We verify those all of the time. We send letters to 
medical staff offices for our former uh, members all of the time, showing them that they were insured during these clinical interactions. But if you do it uninsured, then it's a problem. The next thing is you never want to, if you're a graduate, you don't want to call yourself a student. That's just inappropriate. It's incorrect. It, it's an inaccurate. Uh, medical students are, they have a different set of laws that apply to them. Uh, whereas medical graduates, you have to fall under volunteerism. And so what American Clerkships does is that we strike a fine balance between volunteerism and insured U.S. clinical experiences that is that is residency relevant. And we do that through ACGME core competencies and working with our attending physicians from the perspective of what is expected at the end, which are clinical evaluations based on ACGME core competencies and letters of recommendation, but at the same time for you not to practice medicine without a license. So as a graduate, yes, in American clerkships, you can come in contact with people and people includes patients. And so long as you don't share your opinion uh, as uh, for with regards to diagnosis, treatment, you don't share that with the patient. You only share your opinion with the attending physician. Uh, and it's just a one-way communication. Um, and you don't introduce yourself as a doctor. Uh, and uh, you know, just save all of those for when residency starts. Uh, and, um, and then the attending physician uh, will, will carry out the duties uh, for patient care. Uh, and we, we have our own systems internally that we communicate with the attending physicians and we make sure everything is kept in line. Uh, and uh, now there is another type of clinical experience available as well, and that is in Miami, and that's a postgraduate sub-internship. That is the highest level of clinical experience available in the country to medical graduates only. So if you're looking for any, something more than just being with a private practitioner that goes inside the hospital, and has an outpatient clinic, if you're looking to be with a teaching hospital directly uh, and be processed through the Graduate Medical Education Office and, and even be with program directors and with teams of residents, right, which is the highest level of clinical uh, experience anybody could ever ask for here in the United States, we have that. We have a contract in, in for, with, a, with a teaching hospital in Miami, which was a neuro, nurse Apollo can, can talk more about uh, in your one-on-one -on -one residency strategies. Uh, but, but those are all the different types of, of clinical experiences that are available. So all the way for graduates, all the way from being with uh, program directors and chief residents and residency teams, all the way down to um, you know, shadowing, which, which we don't offer uh, pure shadowing uh, uh, for your entire clinical experience. Okay, uh, would you, uh, are you a medical graduate? Yes. Sure. Would you be able to do wards? In a postgraduate sub-internship, yes. And I believe what you're asking about with wards is doing patient rounds amongst residency teams uh, and being processed through the graduate medical education, very similar to what a U.S. medical student would be processed like. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Right. That would the only place available in the country. American clerkships are not, which we are the only entity that have managed to get this for you, is in Miami, and it's Larkin Community Teaching Hospital, um, and where where you get assigned to teams of residents, and and you don't fly under the radar, right? It's not a physician that calls and asks them to do you a, do us a favor and. Uh, you know, would you please just let my, 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 they call you a student, my students sit in amongst your residents and you do that once or twice a week, maybe once a month. Uh, no, it's not like that. It's actually, you get, you get processed the same way as, uh, as U.S. and, and um, some of the Caribbean medical students, like from St. George's, the really reputable ones, um, get processed through this facility. Um, so yeah, that, that, that will be rounding through the wars and that's the only place that that is available. Now, mind you, I do have to clarify something. You can still round on patients, inpatient facilities, uh, but they're just, you won't be assigned to resident teams. So because attending physicians do that uh, all of the time, especially on hospitalists and inpatient rotation, I believe we have some of those there in Chicago, hospitalists and inpatient, where the attending physician will, will take you and, and, uh, and, and allow you to, to round on patients on the ward. And there may be one or two residents there as well, but you know, you're not being assigned to a hospital you're being assigned to that attending physician, uh, so you're not around. You're not assigned to that hospital. That's that's the main difference. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so this is the last question. It's got to be really quick because uh, your students go back to class. Yes. I have a patient who is going to be going to medical school in the summer, and she has been going to medical school for about ten years. Yes. I have a patient who is going to be going to medical school in the summer, and she has been for general surgery? 
Um, so the, the latest information that you could find would be on NRMP's website, individuals that have matched into different specialties and what their USMLE scores are. Uh, but just remember that that is self-reported, uh, you know, the, the, and, and that so it may not be 100 percent accurate. Uh, but uh, that because of the, the raising of the passing score, uh, that has also shifted uh, the, the, the average scores that we see. So if you score somewhere in the 240s, then uh, then that's a good score for step one. Uh, for general surgery same thing with step two ck uh and uh, you know when you start getting into the 250s that is you know that is so difficult to accomplish and you're gonna just worry yourself to death and you're gonna get so anxious that you don't want to sit through the exam until you can be sure that you you're, you're passing every question on the practice exams and you should be a lot more focused on passing it the first time around rather than trying to get 250 and becoming so anxious and not even taking the exam until you feel 100% ready. You will never feel 100% ready, uh, ever. I don't know anybody that feels ready for taking any of the USMLE exams. It's just a nerve wracking experience. So get to a point where you feel comfortable, you understand your own limitations, and if you don't score a 240, make up for it through great letters of recommendation, great clinical experiences in surgery. Just a high USMLE score will not get you residency interviews, and that's a fact. Thank you very much, Dr. Lizoni. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have to go back. Thank you. I'm sorry if I didn't get to answer all of your questions, but I certainly appreciate uh, your time. And uh, please meet with Nurse, Nurse Pollock. I'll be able to answer all your questions in your one-on-one -on -one residency strategy interviews, and she can contact me that way. Have a great time, everybody, and good luck with your USMLEs and your residency application. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lizoni. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.